Welcome to Alternate Endings. Half audiobook. Half podcast. Full apocalypse. New episodes every Monday. Start your week considering how everything could come to an end. All right, my friends. Welcome back to another episode of Alternate Endings. We sit today in my living room. Um, I am Tyler. This is Cynthia. And your boy, Ivan Wayne. You know how we do over here. So today we are discussing the episode Zenith. I just wanted to immediately start off just so it's not... Yeah, I was going to ask. A little, yes. Just so it's not the confusion of what does it mean. It's no Zathura. <laughs> I'm not in space playing a board game. So Zenith is the time at which something is most powerful or successful. So I was looking around for words. I, d- I didn't want to use apex necessarily because that, I mean, that is so, obviously it makes sense with apex predator and, and how the food chain works, um, the top of that. But I wanted to play around with different words and see what I could find. And I found zenith, which has a second definition. In astronomy, it is the point in the sky or celestial sphere directly above an observer. So in my head... These animals have been taken up from Earth, and they are now in some sort of space station type thing, wherever that is. And that is where they are for this whole encounter. I was wondering how they would do that, where they kept saying the white room and all of that, how that would be on Earth, like where exactly they would choose. But that makes sense if they... So I have a, I have a question with that. Who do you think these beings are that have the capability to make something like this happen? Well, I agree with Cynthia a moment ago because I was kind of thinking during the story if it was physical or if it was digital. Like if this oh. was happening in like a simulation, like it wasn't even a physical thing. Oh. I mean, that's what they did in the Hunger Games, isn't it? Wasn't it all like whoa, simulation? Whoa, whoa. We do not have the rights here <laughs> to speak about the Hunger Games. Well, the Hunger Games was physical, but we can swipe that under the rug so we don't get sued. <laughs> but, you know, it does have some sort of semblance to this story the beings i could imagine it could be what humans have always referred to or speculated as a god a creator it could just be beings like imagine if humans got so strong that we were able to manipulate life on other planets and basically i mean look at zoos right take a zoo and expand it out to a Mm planet-wide environment and you sort of have this manipulated gameplay that's in the story and they've just they've just made it to a point where it's almost like an experiment. I had the announcer of whoever is speaking at the beginning, whatever this character is, whether they're an alien, whether they're a human who's advanced to a certain point to be able to make this. Almost in my mind, I picture like little figurines of all the animals and humans that live as if they have no other difference. They are on the speck of dust that Horton hears, the who. There's just so many different things that I feel like you could play around with that idea. Is it a god? Is it a... And I wanted my character, who I personally hope most of you listeners thought was a pul- was a human most of the time, but eventually picked up on the fact that, wait, maybe this thing I'm following isn't human and just has the same abilities. And turned out to be a polar bear. I want to bring up... You had told me this fascinating thing about how polar bears will actually hunt out humans... I really like how you dash that in the story that the polar bears, maybe the last 10,000 years when we humans have been dominant, they have this leftover uh, angst towards humans because they got right there at the precipice of this competition, but they lost to humans. And I I think that's part of why the reason I chose polar bears. If I'm honest, I don't know what animal would really win. And I would love to hear what other both of you have to say of if you could think of an animal that would win. But part of the reason I chose polar bears is because they are one of the few animals that will actively seek out and hunt humans for a prolonged period of time after spotting them. And so I thought that was a cool little segue of, oh, the reason they do this is because they they don't fully remember, but they have this gut feeling of, I hate you. Right. And that's why Humans I wanted her. Wronged them. Exactly. I wanted her to bring up, aren't there animals you hate? Because th- there was that left over. But yes, to take it back, who do you think would actually, just on land, take away sea, take away air, who on the land do you truly think could win a tournament like this? I think it's easy to kind of think that a big animal would do that just because of the fact that they have the force and they're large. But if you look at 
what animals are headed towards extinction or what animals are in that range, it's usually larger ones. You have the smaller ones that are, but so I feel like it would be something smaller rather than a polar bear or a, I don't know, what other large animals? A cat or a, Elephants yeah. are pretty big, you know. Rhino, hippopotamus. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think it would be a smaller animal. That it would, would be something a... that's stealthy, but it would have to be really, really, really small. Like you were saying that you found an article that said that ants, they think that ants would win out. Yeah, so I, I found a random article on uh, theconversation.com. Don't take it as anything <laughs> scientific or truly mor- miraculous, but they just played with the idea of what animal would win in a in a situation where humans aren't the dominant species. And they chose, they said, I think most people would expect it to be talking chimpanzees or something something close to us. But they toyed with the idea at the end that they think it would be an arthropod of some sort, an insect, and ants take up a huge biomass. I was I was looking up just the percentages of pure biomass, what takes up the most um, on this planet, and a vast majority is plants. 450 gigatons of carbon is from, uh, from plants. Two gigatons are all animals. Compared to 450? Compared to, compared to 450 gigatons That's of plants. That's crazy. And then obviously it just goes even smaller and smaller. And humans make up 0.06 gigatons. Wow. While arthropods make up one whole gigaton. Oh. So if you think about it purely in that sense, they could easily overpower in numbers and in weight. So if you added all the weight of every human currently alive, we are more than doubled if you added up all the insects and bugs. Oh, more than 100 times. More than 100 times? Uh, Yeah. Insects would make up more than 100 times. Well more. And you wouldn't think that because they're so small. But the mere Um, fact that there's millions and billions and trillions of them. You'll have to excuse me. I'm going to drive to the hospital right now because (laughs) I need to check myself in. I I seriously can't even comprehend (laughs) Those numbers. And I, I think that's the reason. So where are they all? Underground. Hiding. My yeah. goodness. You think of an anthill, even better, you, you're you in Africa and you see a giant mound in the ground. And you're like, what is that thing? These tube-like skyscrapers, essentially, that come out of the ground. And they're termites. The termites that have built these giant st- systems underneath the ground. And they're... There are millions upon millions of them underneath. I feel like I did see something a while ago saying that termites have one of the most complex systems of society, and uh, I can't remember what it was, but... I've heard some podcasts about bee colonies, and they're fascinating, Uh and how they'll, they'll... They travel in groups, and they'll communicate regionally, so like if you come into a bee's territory... A group of bees will like swarm up, they meet in the air, they kind of Mm -hmm. talk it out, hash it out in between them, and then they go their separate ways. Yeah, like the bee dance. Yeah. Just to show the pollen. Like, that's already such a complicated way of communication. Just because we can't understand it doesn't mean that that couldn't possibly evolve to be something even more intense. And so that's they could take over. And and, and that's what makes these these insects such a possibility. And I didn't want to go that route. I personally felt like I would have been bored saying how... One million ants <laughs> took down a, a polar bear. All of our ant listeners are yeah, exactly. <laughs> turning us off and unsubscribing. Yeah. Right? But, but the, I mean, they are so cool. So based off of actual weight of the animal, three of the strong, like absolute strongest animals on this planet are insects. The leafcutter ant can carry something 50 times its own body weight. Um, the rhinoceros beetle uh, something can lift something 850 times its own weight. Holy crap. 850? Yeah. And then the dung beetle can pull 1,141 times its own body oh, weight. Crap. So if That's you were to... That's a lot of shit. That is a yeah. lot of shit. That's exactly... You can you can pull that across. Like if you were to scale that up... A thousand. Yeah. These animals would be... If it's a lot of them working together, especially if yeah. they were forced to work to w- together the way that you had it in the story where even ones that are usually predators by themselves get forced to work with one other person or one other animal or with a group of other animals then they could oh, wait. conquer a lot more so these animal facts are coming from what website because it's not the conversation right no it's, no so this is something different these so part of this is is remembering from my animal behavior class but i'm pulling some of this from it's one kind planet again you can trust it as you please okay um, <laughs> so one thing i liked about the story is how 
the computer system or the AI, the gods, whoever they are, they calculated a way to even everybody out. So there was two bears, X amount of links, X amount of ants if they're in the story, right? Yeah. So even if there are more bugs than humans and it outweighs the biomass on Earth, whenever we enter this competition, they're mm-hmm. all set equal. So I can't That's help true. but think that the amount of dung beetles pit against an equal force of gorilla that gorilla is just going to be stomping and those beetles aren't going to stand a chance. And and so that's where it's maybe it isn't even necessarily about weight. The the whole idea for me toying around with the amount needed was I just wanted an even playing field because it's this what we're talking about here. It'd right. be so easy for for a human or gorilla to just stomp on a bunch of beetles. That's why I'm defending the big boys, yeah, so. the, big, the big contenders in the game here because I I sit here and I have this fantasy of like hippo versus gorilla and uh-huh. tiger versus bear i feel like it's going to come down to the to the big creatures i could be very mistaken you got humans and their tool ability that they're always going to be a wild card and just so the listeners know we put this up front in case they didn't catch it at the beginning of this they elevate everyone to human intelligence so all the lynx all the tigers all the bears they're all they all have the same intelligence right yeah so okay. essentially what it is is After that 10,000 years, wherever the humans started to the point where they left off, as soon as everyone's teleported up at the same time or whatever this commences, they are all as intelligent at the very end. So the very last like peak, they go in and they average all the humans. Essentially, they say, we want them smart. We want maybe even a little bit above average Mm -hmm. of skill and intelligence. And we want to see the best of the best fight off around these groupings. Which makes me want to bring up, who do you think could be possible humans that they would select to come into this? Keeping in mind that they will only be added more intelligence regardless or get to whatever point they view as that apex. So even if they're less intelligent, they would be brought up to that. Yep. It's so like the pinnacle of human intelligence, essentially. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll be honest, my first inclination is The Rock, Dwayne Johnson. Oh, I mean, Dwayne! If there's, a, if there's a human being out there that embodies strength, capability, I feel confident in their ability to take out some animals with some tools, I'm going to say maybe The Rock. I mean, they'd smell what he's cooking. That's all I have to say. <laughs> no doubt about that. What I also think about is like people who are not celebrities, who are not famous, like just the hardest people that have come from the streets of wherever in the world, people that nobody will ever know their name, but they've killed people, they've done what it took, and maybe they're not necessarily nice folks, but when pit against lions and alligators, they're going to hold their own. I think there's a lot of people out there that we would not we would never know yeah, their that identity. Yeah, we have no idea. They'd maybe even be the better bet than anyone else, but I just think it's a, a, a fun idea to play around with. Do you think, oh... My grandpa is very strong and smart. He could, I think, he could easily go in there and. and Your grandpa's kick some ass. not gonna be able to whoop some <laughs> Rock Dwayne Johnson material, and I don't think so. And this so, is my world. So. <laughs> was your idea that people and that all animals on Earth knew that this was happening, or that this they just kind of got transported to this other area and everything in life? on earth just kind of stopped for a little bit or they got to see what was going on or what was your no so so basically life on earth pauses this is a 24 hour blip where they are whatever simulation they are in or whatever is going on the power of the people controlling it can stop that moment to bring everyone up and then that's why they had no no idea what was going on at first some of them like wait why i understand more like this feels so different i'm I need a second to get used to it. The voice at the beginning kind of eases them into it. And she even says, or I picture her as a she. So when when you listen to it, I apologize if you don't get that it's a woman who's speaking at the beginning. But she says, you will slowly start to gain memories of past events of this happening. We want you to be able to understand what's going on here and know that it has happened for millions upon millions of years. And so for however long your species has been there, you will slowly start to get some of that back to help it understand you understand what's going on or maybe help you in winning or mm-hmm. getting further along in the process. So the idea is that this has been happening all along Earth's history and that the reason humans really step up to the plate about 10,000 years ago, that 10,000 mark in your story was not a coincidence, right? It like explains that humans won last time, mm-hmm. which, means there were, which means that there was a period where dinosaurs wrecked shop like 300 times in a row reign supreme yeah, it was no contest 
as I was doing some research, I really wanted to try and find an animal that somehow could have beat the dinosaurs. And that's the reason why these all-powerful creators decided to throw a meteor and kill them all. Mm. But I just... I couldn't find something that was woolly mammoth. Yeah, it, and it could or very well could have been. Yeah, it could it very easily could have been some bigger mammal that was like, "All right, enough of this lizard shit. I am down for some mammal, some mammal time." Yeah, something happened in that fight on that particular ep- mm-hmm. um, event that birthed the mammals. The dinosaurs fell. I think it leaves so much room for imagination of what happened in all those different fights or like what else happened. And I mean, in this story, all I talk about is the land. You have no idea what's going on for the sea version or the the air version with hawks and with crows and with so those vultures. Are, those are completely different battles, right? Is I'm making them system? entirely different battles. I, I imagine it as some sort of maybe the bald eagle, which is one of the strongest animals that can lift while mid-flight can lift several times its own weight as well. Or the sea. Maybe it's killer whales or orcas or... Sharks. Sharks. Dolphins. O- octopus. Jellyfish. Who won last time. And for whatever reason, they've both air and sea have decided to use that championship power in a different way than humans took it yeah. when they finally got to that point. So that's kind of ruminating. We often think of octopus or octopi as the smartest thing in the ocean. And I kind of theorized that what if they won last time? And so for the last 10,000 years, octopi have been similar to humans in intellect, but they all just decided let's live sustainably and stay down here in the ocean. Let's work on camouflage. Let's work on other things instead of building skyscrapers, taxing one another and coming Mm -hmm. up with countries and et cetera. Animals in general, even now without everyone being on the same playing field like we've already talked about and so far they have such interesting and in-depth communication tactics and mating rituals and so many different things that are they are intelligent to some to some level i mean it takes it it takes a lot of evolution to get to that point also Mm. and so that's why i have her at the beginning she talks about congratulations to the ones who are finally here for the first time or or you maybe you've been here a long time because in that 10 Maybe not even necessarily in the 10,000 years. Maybe that, that that's way too short of a time. But there, there's going to be some ebb and flow of how these animals are, are acting, especially now that humans have ruled for so long. We've changed that environment drastically, so they've had to adapt. You had mentioned to me before that over half of the current apex predators on Earth are classified as like big cats, which blew my freaking mind. And... And just from lists I've looked at, and if, if you think about it in general, even if you think about the cat you have rubbing up against your leg right now, purring, wanting some attention, if that cat was outdoors, it would be a killer. That pure hunting instinct that even in house cats that have been domesticated still stands so strong. I, I just found a list um, through Info Galactic, which is basically just like an animal, from what I found, an animal type version of, of Wikipedia almost. It just has a bunch of different things and so i found a a page has extinct dinosaurs that they believed are apex predators so i thought that was really cool but then it goes if you scroll down it goes to extant which is animals that are still alive and of the terrestrial you look through and a vast majority of them are cats i mean there's snakes and there's lizards and there's bears and there's tasmanian devil which isn't this is more canine like there's dogs and different but I just think it's so interesting that so many of them are cats. I also wanted to mention of the final eight, I saw that a honey badger was included in that list. Oh, the honey badger. <laughs> I've watched many a YouTube videos, seen several memes, more memes than I would care to to share with the world. But I feel like the honey badger, you hear that and you're like, oh, that's so funny. But then you you look at their actual behaviors and they are ferocious and they are deadly and, and they're an apex predator. And they're an apex predator. Oh, we not never that. thought, yeah. Yeah, and and so they're, I mean, their sense of smell and their, their, their smarts, like they'll bury a kill that they had made and keep it in the snow for like months at a time and will know how to get directly back to where that is, even if they change the position of where they bury certain things. They can go get that animal that they want at that time. A, I thought it'd be kind of funny, but B, they are also an apex predator that... I think if they found the right matchup in that time and found their way through, they'd have a chance to, to make it to a final eight. 
How big are honey badgers? I'd say like big dogs. Really? Not like a Great That's Dane, but like a bigger than like I thicker, probably them. as heavy as a lab. You know, mentioning dog breeds, I was going through the list of apex predators that are on Earth, and I came across wolves. And saw a picture of some wolves taking down a bison. I was like, oh man, they are an apex predator. And I thought, what have we done in human history to the wolf? They've all now descended and um, diversified into everything from a teacup poodle and a Pomeranian up to a Great Dane and like an Irish Setter. Massive dogs. And it just makes me think, like, what if a being, like a human, came in and altered and diversified other species? Like, what? look at all the options we could get from a bear or all the options mm-hmm. you could get from a human if you selected them all. And generation after generation after generation you selected for only certain things. We'd end up with, it's just very, it is just so fascinating to look at because, as you mentioned, house cat. You blow it up 30 times its size, it looks like a lion. It looks like a tiger. They didn't change much, they just got smaller. If you blow up a Pomeranian the size of a wolf, I'm running out of the house (laughs) and out of the neighborhood and I'm never coming back. That would be terrifying. Terrified Chihuahua, same. The ferocious, just the same. They got got smaller and they changed in all of their bone structures, their coloration. It's just fascinating. It's a cool cool idea to play around with that you think about what variations you could possibly get as time goes on. And that, I think, is partly the, the question that the, these creators are trying to answer. What happens when all of a sudden now the new winner is, is the polar bear? I don't say it. I'm so sorry to spoil something that you may or may not have wanted to know mm. at the end of the story. Hot take, hot take. But... I personally, as the writer, I think the polar bear was going to win that one. And I just wanted to leave some sort of a, a gap for our, our listeners to, to settle into and wait. Um, but, I mean, what happens when polar bears are the dominant species? Are they going to d- diversify and, and split up and become something new? Or what happens from that point? Will they heard? truly drink Coca-Cola or Pepsi? <laughs> I, yeah, you know, I but. think that is the most important question I should have answered before. We're all dying to know, Tyler. You know, I have a, it's just a funny thought to me that like humans get reduced to few million, whatever. They get dispersed. Humans get descended back to like chimp or orangutan level intelligence. So they're out there, you know, foraging again. And then the bears are all standing around looking at Los Angeles, New York City, Tokyo. And they're thinking, what do we do with this? Do we inhabit it? I can't fit in any of these offices. I can't fit inside a Toyota. I'm a polar bear. I can't even use that car. They'd have to completely redesign everything that the humans left behind. And they'd be able to. And the good thing is they have 10,000 years, right? Exactly. Until at, the next at minimum. Yeah. At, yeah. And so part of that is at, at the very end when the announcer is going over the, the stipulations of winning, every new champion brings about some sort of destruction. Who knows? Maybe a another meteor or global warming kills off everything all the majority of the humans up to that point the keys or the the yellowstone volcano blows yeah exactly and so it destroys all of this land all over the planet something every volcano blows something of the sort and it, it creates almost a fresh slate that will freeze the planet and essentially make it right for for polar bears You earned this opportunity to be number one overall. So we are going to set your scene. To go back a little bit, when I was picking what I wanted, I wanted polar bears. I really loved being able to uh, look through Inuit names because they have such beautiful meanings behind each of these. So Tulak, the, the male polar bear, the meaning of his name is warrior or god of the stars. And so I thought that was just so fitting with with Zenith on top of that. Like you are up above a celestial sphere of some sort his name was basically predetermined as you are the god the warrior of these stars that you are fighting in now and then yuki is survivor a i really like the sound of it i thought it was easier to pronounce if i'm honest but also uh, the meaning survivor is exactly what she was at the very end she was she was smart and and she was able to make it to the end through her own cunning throughout and help with um, Tulak to get him to that point. And she was the one who ultimately ended up being the survivor. Man, coming back to the names. I love it. <laughs> love because it's funny names. because we don't always mention it, but a lot of the names in the stories that we feature on alternate endings have deeper roots because when the first time comes for you to use a character's name in the story, 
you have thousands of options and it's like, well, which one am I going to pick? You start trying to narrow it down based on meaning and such. So it's always neat to hear the origins. You only have a limited amount of space that you can convey some sort of meaning. Even if it's hidden and needs to be explained, it at least adds that little bit of layer that you can you can add on to or you can grab a hold of and and make something bigger from. I'll admit one of my most terrifying moments in your story was when they walked out and the anaconda was strangling another animal. And I, I didn't even think about the fact that big snakes would be in this competition. And if I was a human selected and I saw the python, nope, I'm done. Yeah, I'm it's over. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go over here and face a hippo, elephant. I don't care. I'm not facing an anaconda. It's over. I, I, I will bow down. It's what over. would you even be able to do at that point? Are there stories of humans beating out anacondas that are trying to kill them? Not by themselves, but I've seen horrifying YouTube videos because my most common rabbit hole that my fiance can attest to is that I start looking at giant snake videos and I get scared. Oh, no. Uh, villagers will get wrapped up in an anaconda and then the whole like crew of people, like 10 to 12 people, will pull it off of the person Holy and crap. hopefully they can get out with just a few bones broken. But yeah. if you're by yourself, you're done. No way. You're done for. No, I'm sorry. Go Did ahead. Did you have an idea of how many humans would be in this? Like what they would make that as the equivalent to the other animals so i toyed around a lot with playing out stating what the number of each animal would be but i think it just adds a, another layer that you can think about on your own of so if you have two polar bears how many humans do you think you would need equal intelligence to be able to take both of them down I would say without guns and they get to make some tools from the environment i would say eight and there's That's three left at the end, right? Yes. So by the time they have gone through two rounds of the tournament style at the very end and through however long it took, how many animals they had to go through to get to that point, that is what they've ended with. They've ended with three. In my mind, I had the six to eight range hmm. that mm -hmm. their, their previous experience and use of tools was enough that six of them should be... I mean, if you think about hunting crews, you're not going out with, with more than that many. No. So we've known for a while that a smaller number of capable beings are probably going to do better at a certain point than even more would. Well, think about a group project at school. Past oh, a certain yeah. limit, three, four, five people, you just end up standing around. Like, because division of labor, specification of task, like... If you get more than like 10 people trying to fight two polar bears, there's some people who are going to be standing around because they don't know what to do. Yeah, They don't know what to do and the, and there's just, you need a leader at some point. But I feel like if you have a smaller number, number, each person can lead to their own extent. Maybe they're best in one category. But like you said, you get beyond that and it's just a standing around or in this case it would be, oh, I've, I'm too comfortable now. It's. I just want to step back a second because it was so funny that you brought up what you would do, a human would do against an anaconda. And there's a TV show that partially inspired this whole idea called Animal Face Off. It was on Discovery Channel and Animal Planet, aired in 2004, oh. and then I mostly watched it on Spike TV as a kid. And it's only one season, but it's it's this idea where they take two animals that necessarily wouldn't ever interact. They go through, they talk about all their strengths and all their weaknesses and, and pair them against other animals. Yeah, they have one. I don't think it's an anaconda, but it is a it is a large snake that they have go against. It is an anaconda, actually. They have a jaguar versus an anaconda. Can you guess who would win between those two? Jaguar. Anaconda. Anaconda won. Oh, man. I think it's I, that's part of what this was for me is putting that idea to a, a greater scale of what happens if these battles actually mean something. I think another one on here is the American alligator versus American black bear. And so that's part of where I got my saltwater crocodile versus polar bear because it has kind of happened before. But what if you scale it up a little bit and there's intelligence and there's differences in numbers? And in that one, actually, the, the black bear wins that one too. But I, as I was doing research onto the saltwater crocodile, it is the biggest reptile and the strongest one. And if you go back to its previous ancestors, the bite force... The saltwater crocodile has the strongest measured bite force of any animal on Earth, um, at least land-wise, that they've been able to test. If you were to test its ancestor that was several times its size, its bite force 
would have been twice, all estimated, of course, would have been twice what they think a Tyrannosaurus Rex bite force would be. Whoa. Holy crap. And it's based off of the design of the skull, its jaw strength. And so I just think the idea of beating something with that much strength in its jaw, it's a task to overcome. And that's why his arm was hanging by threads. Exactly. <laughs> that is why poor Tulak lost his entire arm from... A bite and death roll of a saltwater crocodile. Teddy bear threads. Yep. Well, you know, prehistoric crocs and alligators were competing with dinosaurs. I don't know exactly the timeline for when they came online against T-Rex, but they were competing with harsher climates, bigger animals, and, you know, terrifying creatures, but terrifying odds, too. And and they've lasted forever. I mean, you, you talk about these different animals, the sharks, alligators, and some of these lizards that have that are look exactly like dinosaurs and to some extent it's because they basically are they're they are remnants of this dominant species that is that had lived for so long that it had won so many tournaments they couldn't do it this time on the show we often talk about the hubris of humans and how we think we're big top animals we are supreme we run the planet in some ways i guess it could be said we do but it's interesting because humans always think that we're first place. But I think it really depends on what's the race, what's the competition. Because if it's land speed, we're nowhere near first. If it's jaw strength, we're nowhere near first. If it's size, if it's uh, lifting weight, the dung beetle is in first, right? We only come in first when it comes to intelligence and maybe opposable thumbs that allow us to hold and make weapons but there are so many categories in which humans just fail miserably against the rest of the organisms on the planet i mean even just let's see i just looked up how fast a human the fastest human speed is and 28 miles per hour 28 Same miles goal. an hour which mm -hmm. is pretty fast yeah that is pretty fast but then you look pretty up fast? the fastest are you insane? animal 28 miles an hour very fast that's so crazy <laughs> but yeah compare that to the fastest animal um, 68 miles an hour to 75, which is the cheetah. For the course. cheetah, the fastest mm -hmm. land. And let's not even mention that humans can't fly. And the, yeah, and funny you say that because the peregrine falcon is the fastest bird with a diving speed of 242 miles per hour, which is wild. You, you can't avoid that. And so that that's where I had to add in the use of tools because without tools, humans would, there's no way they would ever yeah. make it past it. And so I just, I needed that humans take or leave how um, strong they would actually be they know what to do with their surrounding they've we've done it for 10,000 years to be able to adapt and to overcome I can I, can you imagine a few even more futuristic version where they allow these all of these animals you can make whatever you want inside of your little room you're in now there is stuff to make guns you've never seen before you can make sh like tasers you can make so many different things like what happens when everyone has the ability to make these tools and humans are the humans and apes are the ones sitting there like oh cool i have these thumbs that i can actually do it while well, you've got a lizard or or a giant anaconda that's like, oh, I'm just going to squeeze him to death anyways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a bear, even if it wanted to use the tools, it couldn't. It, it couldn't have. grab them. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think at the, near the very end, right before I'm about to say it, Yuki says, oh, shoot, we should have done something with tools. And Tulak responds, we're not going to use them anyway. Hmm. How are we going to use it? And I hope that was a moment where you're like, wait, why wouldn't you have been able to use tools? You're a, you're a human. That's what you're good at. But nope. You're a polar bear. <laughs> That's it. So to wrap us up here, is there any lasting impression that you have from the story itself as something that stood out or that you particularly enjoyed? I liked the idea of putting these animals against each other that wouldn't really necessarily be next to each other in the wild. Like you wouldn't find a crocodile or any of that with a polar bear. And so it's interesting to see how you put those together and how... Just thinking about the idea of someone or something doing that and comparing their strengths against each other and weighing those. I think it's crazy to consider that evolution as we know and that Darwin taught us is still occurring in this universe. But at the same time, the dominant species is being manipulated and propped up by some higher power. And so they're actually coming in and manipulating like a human designing an aquarium. Natural fish things will occur in that aquarium, but the environment is made. Things that are introduced intentionally. It's almost like 
something is being done to Earth, what we do to other animals when we make zoo exhibits and when we make aquariums and stuff. So it's super neat to think in the past and in the future of like every 10,000 years, who was the victor at that time? Yeah, I do like that too. Like you said, how you can, it has implications for thinking about the past and thinking about the future. I don't think we've had many stories like that where they go to the past and the future. Well, you know, that makes me so happy to hear that you've you've pulled out these big overlying blip that that made me so excited to be able to write this story and with that death comes for us all thank you for listening next time we return with a brand new audiobook story assuming the world is still standing by then We would like to thank Kevin McLeod for his music found on incompetech.com.